this is Joseph Coco. I'm at Ape 2017 on behalf of Becky Holburn's Art Process YouTube channel and blog. If you could introduce yourself, Ainsley. Hi, I'm Ainsley Yeager. Okay, and what brings you to Ape this year? Uh, this year, um, this is actually my first year at Ape. It's actually my first convention in the entire state of California. I am a Seattle-based cartoonist. Okay. And the big reason I wanted to come to Ape was that I heard that it is a really good crowd for selling books at. Yeah. And something I've been focusing on more is actually going and self-publishing my own content. <laughs> Fantastic. So um, you say that like uh, you were doing something different beforehand. Are they primarily, did they start off as webcomics? Um, Venture Force started off as a webcomic. Um, the Mystery of La Luna was kind of a thing, was a short story that my friend and I did together. And I posted some of the pages online, but not all of them. Okay. Um, primarily what I used to do at conventions, I mostly did stuff like fan art prints. Right. And I kind of decided like, even though like I had fun doing that, it wasn't it wasn't really where my heart was. <laughs> okay, but you were making comics that whole time. You just weren't mm -hmm. necessarily printing them and trying to sell them at shows. Yeah, a lot of time at shows. I like especially with Venture Forth. Like I just started it to make sure I didn't get rusty at drawing while I was working a forty-hour workweek job. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, I'll do a page week. Presumably and, not not comics related. Uh, no, it wasn't comics related. It yeah. was it was. That's most people, so... Yeah, it was a image production job, so it was at least Creative. somewhat helpful. <laughs> yeah. But overall, yeah, not, not a lot of opportunities to, like, make use of my illustration chops. Okay. And Venture Forth is a, a story that um, you had ruminated on for a while, or you just decided you wanted to create a comic and uh, it just came about from there? Uh, Venture Forth is more like a comic journal. Like, I would just talk about things that happened to me, like, at some point, or, like, an observation. Most of it... In, in there I could say is probably most of it's about learning how to be an adult and not sell your soul. Okay. And from there, like I kind of just did it for a few years while I was working my, my nine to five job. Mm -hmm. And then I ended up getting laid off and I was like, well, I'm gonna try doing this full time. And I worked more on Venture Forth, but a big problem I had was that I realized I had time to do longer stories. And so I was like, you know, I think this is a good time to wrap up Venture Forth. And once I did that, I was like, I'm going to put this in a book and, and print it. Hopefully yeah. I can sell it to other people and they'll like it. Okay. And what was your process for that? I assume it's self-published? It is self-published. Uh, okay. I did try to run a Kickstarter for it, but it was a very pie in the sky, like the dream book I wanted. So it didn't yeah. quite get funded. I got, I was almost there. But what and I ended up doing instead did you, was... Did you talk to people beforehand, or were I you just like... I did talk to people beforehand. Okay, I was just it, making sure. Yeah, it, um, it wasn't my first Kickstarter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because, I mean, some people will just look at the, the large success stories and think, well, I can do that too. But oh, if, yeah, you, if you look at the overall community, sure, most comics, I think it's something like 60-70% end up getting funded, but mm -hmm. a lot of them are at very reasonable cost points, like yeah. 1,000, 600, you know, not yeah. 10,000 or whatnot. Yeah, I was asking for 5,000 for it, and I, I knew it was kind of up there, but I really wanted to do it just because it was a print run I couldn't afford to do out of pocket. But sure. I knew, as a backup plan, I could do a digital black and, black and white run. I could pay for that out of pocket. Yeah. Um, so is the comic uh, done through an offset printer or a digital printer? It's digital. Okay. So it's print-on-demand? Uh, yeah, it's a print-on-demand service. Um, the company is called Kness, and I can't, I honestly can't say anything bad about them. They have been great Fantastic. and have been very good with communication. Okay, that's good. Yeah, most people have at least the idiosyncrasies about, well, if you go with this, you need to make sure to do this or that. Mm -hmm. So it's good to hear that, I mean, your experience was basically neutral, which to, yeah. as far as printing goes, means it was good. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. And like, I will definitely say I have a leg up on a lot of other people because when I was pretty young, like 18, I knew that I wanted to do self-publishing in some capacity. Sure. So I actually went to school to learn how to do graphic design specifically for print. Okay. And I learned like all these different tips and tricks of like how to pre-flight stuff, like things to look out for when you're sending your work to a printer. Yeah. And I took that knowledge and I just basically carried it with me and be like, okay, now I, ha I have this and now I can like self-publish things. And right. Not so you did your due diligence. Up. So oh, there yeah. wasn't much room for the, the comic to be messed up in the first place because you, yeah. you gave them basically a pristine product. <laughs> yeah, basically. Generally with print, there's always going to be something that's just like, oh, like this isn't exactly how I wanted, but it's good enough. Like there's, I, I pretty firmly believe there's no such thing as a perfect print job because that's the nature of it. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, my family actually uh, publishes a newspaper, so mm -hmm. they work. They have a pretty close relationship with their press, but there's mm -hmm. often kinks that they need to go back and forth with. Oh, the, absolutely. The press. I mean, like, pr 
print checking for color, it's like that is a career that people have. Like you're not, yeah. it's not always gonna be perfect. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, where is Venture Forth going from here? Uh, do you plan on continuing it or is it a, a self-contained? Uh, Venture Forth, I am actually going to leave it like as is, I'm not gonna do any more. I might okay. do like little small comics here and there, here and there that are like more personal. Yeah. But overall, right now I'm kind of between projects, so I'm gonna be working more on like little shorter stories while I work on a much bigger project that I'm hoping to launch as a webcomic in early 2018. Okay, and we can hear about announcements on that on your social media? Oh yes, absolutely. Um, okay. On my website, uh, Ainsley.com, that's Ainsley with two A's and two Y's. Okay, yeah, that's that's difficult. <laughs> yeah, it's it's easy to type, but then I didn't realize like once I got it's like, oh yeah, like actually you saying You have to say it, it every time, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, so can you tell me about some of your other works? Yeah, definitely. So another thing I did was um, I have this book called Mystery of La Luna. That is something that a friend wrote and I illustrated it. Okay. It is kind of our open love letter to retro science fiction stories. Yeah, I got the impression of that just from the cover. So you yeah, that, did a good job. Yeah, I was very happy with that. I was like looking at all these really helpful posters. Like, okay, I need to capture this essence. Yeah. Um, I haven't personally read too much, but Becca reads a lot, so I've got a, yeah. a good yeah. taste for what the covers of those books look like. Awesome. Uh, almost any time she goes to a uh, used bookstore, she runs straight over to the old fiction section and yeah. tries to find some of the older stuff. Um, but yeah, a lot of that is uh, available online as well. So what was the inspiration behind uh, uh, La Luna? You, you... Oh, so La Luna kind of started when a friend and I were talking about, like, older sci-fi and how we were kind of disappointed in a lot of like the newer stuff of like Man, seeing the dark. near future as like being really dark dystopian and we're like we just want like these fun buck roger adventures yeah and they're like something like especially like bite size like like outer limits or twilight zone where it's like you have an interesting story you do that and then you move on mm -hmm. and so we we're like okay let's let's work together and and like come up with the story and we're gonna we're gonna print it and we actually also kickstarted this book this is my very first kickstarted book cool um so would you would you say that the story is hopeful like some of the older sci-fi or you just avoided um going down more pessimistic uh oh we mostly avoided going down a pessimistic route it's not really so much as like a prediction of the future as yeah. we wanted to do a fun adventure story set in a retro sci-fi setting that was a little more optimistic and not just like we have these beautiful glass towers that the rich live in then there's then there's the undercity where the poor live and die yeah um so what uh, particularly drew you to ape um i know you said that uh you heard that that books do well here mm -hmm. um so what was the trip like down from Seattle? Did you fly here or did you drive? I did fly here. Um, a, big reason, a big reason too was I've just never done a show in California. And uh, okay. I thought so you wanted to see what the scene was like I definitely here, wanted basically. to see what the scene was like. And yeah. Ape happened to be at a good time for me in terms of I scheduled other conventions. Okay. And I was just like, this seems like a fun show and I really want to try it. Because like, I've heard nothing but great things about the crowd here, about people like being really interested in original content. Yeah. And like that certainly cannot be said about all shows I go to. Yeah. Uh, so you do independent comic, uh, independent cons in uh, Seattle? Uh, yeah, I do a lot of conventions in Seattle. I'm pretty much at Emerald City Comic Con every year. I'm going awesome. to be at Geek Girl Con next week. Um, there's also, I also do shows in Portland just because it's only a three hour drive for me yeah. and I have family there, so it just costs me gas to go there. Yeah. And then I have Kumori Con there in a few weeks. And then, cool. weirdly enough, I also do reptile shows because I have a bunch of reptile art. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Um, so, do people commission you at those shows, or they're just buying uh, prints of, of Um reptile? A lot of time at those shows, uh, people don't really commission me, but they usually buy prints. They'll be like, oh, I have a ball python. I'll buy your ball python, your ball python prints. Sure. It'll be a friend for their python. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, I've, I've talked to other artists about doing shows that mm -hmm aren't necessarily a comic show or an art show. Um, like for instance, uh, horror shows often uh, get some crossover with tattoos and special effects makeup yeah. and things like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, what's your experience um, like? Firstly, what made you decide to actually do a reptile show considering you probably don't know a whole lot of artists that work yeah, in. Yeah, um, usually I am the only artist at those shows. Sometimes there might be one other person who's like selling stickers of like different kinds of reptiles. Yeah. 
And basically it just came down to, I was usually already attending these shows because I love reptiles. Yeah. yeah. I, okay. It's like, I love them. And I usually like pick up like supplies I need there. Cause it's cheap. It's easier to just get it at these biannual shows than to like order it online and hope that my $40 UV light bulb doesn't break in the, in the mail. Sure. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, a lot of time it's just like, it's definitely different. And I, I know I stand out a lot, mm -hmm. but I also feel like the content I bring there, like I don't bring all my comics. I don't bring all my fandom prints, but yeah. like, I gear myself more towards like what I think that crowd wants. And like, there's certainly people there that have no idea why I'm there and think it's weird <laughs> that I was allowed in. But then I have other people who are just like, no, oh, this is great. I love that there, there are artists here that are like drawing cute reptiles and I can, I can buy it. Yeah, okay. Well, I mean, hopefully that'll encourage other people to try shows um, outside of the general mm -hmm. wheelhouse of, of uh, um, anime cons and, yeah. and independent comic cons. I will definitely sort of say it's harder to find like those finding a different niche to go into but once you do like it can be kind of nice because you can it's nice to be the big fish in a small pond sometimes <laughs> yeah uh so what about singularity yeah um, so singularity this is a comic anthology i did a few years ago uh this is it is a robot and robotics uh fanzine uh, both of them are about the same thing all have art contributed by artists all over the world and I basically paid for this out of pockets because I just wanted to do a book about robots. Okay, so you organized the, the fancy? Yeah, I organized the whole thing. I paid people only by, I could only pay them $5 a page, but I also gave them the file so that if they wanted to, they could they print it print themselves. It. Yeah. yeah, and I think a lot of people, um, certainly when it's early on in their careers, are just looking uh, for things to put on their table, basically, mm -hmm. because if you work these kind of shows, um, Sometimes people will even just avoid your table if you don't have enough work on it. Oh yeah, that's definitely a problem. Um, so, I mean, I think that's that's awesome. Uh, it, it, did you did you have a like? Uh, were you part of a social group that was into this sort of thing, and the project just um, kind of came um, from you guys getting excited about it, or you just? decided you were going to do a fanzine and settled on, on doing more um, I mostly just decided I was going to do a fanzine. I talked to some friends who had more experience with doing anthologies. I was like, hey, I'm thinking about doing my doing my zine this way yeah. as an anthology. Like, what do you think of that? And they gave me some really great feedback. And then afterwards, I went to a few conventions. I had little postcards made of the art I actually got commissioned like for the covers. I was like, hey, I'm doing I'm doing this this zine and I'm looking for people who want to submit to it and like the only thing I require is that it has to relate to robotics something mechanical or AI and beyond okay. that you can go crazy with it yeah and I like I was kind of surprised how much interest there was because I thought it was really niche but now <laughs> I guess robots are becoming an in thing so I was like yeah <laughs> I mean I think either people have an interest drawing robots or they might just want to do it to try to challenge themselves mm -hmm. because like Becca, for instance, um, she likes robots, but she almost never draws them or cars. Yeah. So she um, actually wants to do more like commission sort of stuff of robots, but mm -hmm. because people don't see it on her table, they don't even think, hey, this yeah. girl can draw robots, you know? Uh, so yeah, it's super cool that um, you were able to, to draw up a crowd like that. And it's also, it uh, it seems like a, a good way to approach people um, at mm -hmm. a convention, like, hey, I have this thing, if you'd like, you can participate in it. Yeah, and no, like, I was definitely chatting up with people. I didn't like go to every table like, hey, you should submit to my, my thing. It'd be like, I yeah, talked to them, be like, hey, like, if, you're look, if you're looking to be in more anthologies and zines, like, I have one going on right now. Yeah. And I'm actually making a point of paying artists and making sure that you have a way to make money from it. Yeah. Because like, I couldn't afford to actually pay people like a living page rate because like, this is a passion project pretty much completely out of pocket. Yeah, and well, like, I, people I think got it. probably from like a two to five minute conversation, people could see that you're not just trying to scam them. Oh yeah, um, like this was this is a very earnest like passion project where I was just like, I just really love robots, and I want there to be a robot book. No one's done a robot book, and there's that old adage of if, like, if it's not there, you need to make it. <laughs> yeah. So, how do you feel about the project now that that it's out? Like, would you recommend people organize fanzines, or do you feel like it was too much work? Um, or? I thought it was a fair amount of work. Um, there was a lot of wrangling people who were a little late on their submissions, but I yeah. planned so ahead you, for that. So you did give everybody deadlines? And... I gave everybody deadlines. I had check-ins, and a lot of people kind of waited until last minutes, Yeah. which is kind of normal, but I knew that that was coming, so I buffered things out. So, like, I had... 
the deadline of like I think I said it's sometime in like December, mm-hmm. but the real deadline was like I needed to have everything done by March for Emerald City Comic Con. Yeah, yeah, it it makes sense because. Um, Becca plans a lot of her stuff around cons, you know, in terms of releasing things. Yeah. Like, that's, to her, that's the deadlines. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, definitely, like, the the con is kind of, like, the real deadline, but I like having things done ahead of time so that I can prep for my convention and not need to worry about finishing a product beforehand. Sure. Uh, and finally, um, so let me get your... Uh, Ainsley, yeah, I have on one screen. real business card left. <laughs> oh, it's fine. Okay. Um, yeah, if you want to, yeah, so you we can have get that. Your logo. Uh, and we can buy your comics and your pins here. Yep, you can get pretty much everything I'm selling at my table out my site. Fantastic. And I also wanted to ask you if you have any advice for um, artists who are considering tabling at eight for the first time. So weirdly enough, I actually have a lot of advice for that. And a few days ago, I did a thread on my Twitter about advice for people early, like people going to conventions, just like how you can kind of set up your table. Yeah. But the biggest advice I'd probably have is if like, even if you are struggling to like make your money back, like that's pretty normal at the beginning. Yeah. And so like, don't, don't lose hope right away. Like it definitely takes time. Sure. Okay. Well, thank you so much for talking to me, Ainsley, and I hope you have a great day. Yeah. Thanks. You too.